Hello, everyone. Welcome to Class of 2020, The Columbia Way. We're so glad that you have joined us. Um, hopefully, you've seen some other programs online as well. There will be more to follow. And in the chat, um, if you want to see the full list, we will put the link um, during the presentation today. You certainly are in for a treat. I'm uh, so excited to welcome a friend and former CA board member who has really made a difference in our alumni community. Marion Benacarum is the head of marketing at Nextdoor, and she is a fearless force for change who shows organizations how to shift mindsets and build themselves through the lens of purpose. She's known for her track re record of creating and leading successful brands and demonstrates how to define your purpose differentiate your brand, make the case for change, rally the troops internally, and share it with the world. And she's going to give you tips on what you can do as you start your professional career after your time as a student at Columbia. Mariam has more than 25 years of experience managing global brands and international teams. She was most recently the global CMO of Hyatt Hotels, repositioning the Hyatt brand as purpose-driven by putting the guests at the center of the business. Her brand work at Hyatt resulted in increased brand awareness and organic user acquisition across online and offline channels. Prior to Hyatt, Mariam was SVP and CMO of Gannett. She also sits on Adweek's Women Trailblazers Council Board, Fast Company's Impact Council, and is the U.S. Board Chair of Reporters Without Borders. Please welcome Mariam. And Mariam, thanks so much for participating today and giving these new alumni some wonderful advice on what to do as they start their careers. Thank you, Donna, for having me. It's always great to be um, with fellow alums from Columbia. So I think I'm going to start. Um, so I was going to actually walk you guys through about 20 pages of a presentation and then really allow for us to have more of a conversation, which I know is sort of how we're all living virtually. Um, and Jenna, I don't know if it's possible to start with the um, slideshow. Um, perfect. Okay. So good morning. Um, I, as you heard, have been a marketer for many years, really, um, since my time uh, at Columbia. And I would go to the next slide. So I think everyone really is born a brand manager. Um, the brand that you were really born to manage, I would say, is you. And it's probably not how you think of yourself, but it is, in fact, um, a proposition I'd like to propose to you. So if we go to the next slide, wh what is a brand, right? A brand is the promise of the value that someone is going to receive, right? So it's not so much about how you think of yourself as much as it is about how others perceive you. Um, and great brands, right, probably the brand everybody talks about the most is Apple, right? It's sort of the brand for the creative community. And it's about how you perceive the Apple brand, not so much how they perceive themselves. But they do. But to get to that, it's actually kind of a deliberate process. So let's go to the next slide. And I would say, um, you know, I went through this exercise years ago, which is like really this idea of the brand called you. And so here's a picture of me in the days when iPads actually first came about. Um, the idea of personal branding really came about in 1997. Let's go to the next slide. Tom Peters, um, who is a preeminent um, thinker in the marketing space and particularly in the marketing space, um, wrote this, um, wrote this article for Fast Company called The Brand Called You. And really he talks about how brands are no longer linear and that basically the aggregation of all your experiences become your personal brand. And I think that's really true. I've had, you know, as you heard, many jobs and I think it's really the aggregation of those things that sort of create my brand. And I, I'll talk to you a little bit about that. Um, if we go to the next slide. Um, okay, no, go to the next slide because something's happening to myself. Okay, I think it used to be, right? It used to be that um, in generations past that people were defined by one job. You went to IBM, you worked at IBM for a really long time. You were an IBM man or woman. In those days, probably more likely a man. Um, and so, you know, you stayed there, you were loyal, it sort of defined you and um, 
you then expected a pension and they sort of took care of you. That paradigm shifted in my lifetime and more and more people, partly because of the internet, partly because we began to live through different periods of crisis, people began thinking of themselves less as a company person and more as an individual. And as a result, the aggregation of um, a lot of experiences actually become cumulative for you. Um, and I think that's true. You see even in 2011, um, here it's interesting to me that they still at that time had um, you know, men as the picture, but sort of this idea that um, it's a, a combination of things that come to be your brand. Okay, next page. So how do you actually get to defining your brand? I think the first step is like a discovery phase. Like anything, you know, I joined Nextdoor in February, and the first thing I do is I try and understand the history and also like how people perceive it, and then also then do some um, research to understand the, the competition and also the opportunity, right? And so for me, when I was trying to figure out what my brand stood for somewhere in my career, I actually um, did an exercise where I went back to any time anybody had written a review for me or an assessment. Um, and I also then came up with a survey, like three questions that I sent to people who knew me or who had worked with me and asked them to sort of describe me. And that sort of became an input for me as I thought about doing the exercise on myself that I do sort of professionally for a brand. And then I thought of myself um, sort of in my peer set in terms of who my competition was and then also like who in the end was my target audience, right? And for most of you graduating, probably your target audience is um, the employee base of whatever job or market that you want to go into, right? So how are you different from all the others that show up um, for a job? I'm sure is top of mind for many of you. But this is true even if you want to be an entrepreneur or a journalist. How, you know, journalists um, have identities too. If you think about Charles Blow, who's an opinion columnist for the Times, he definitely has a brand. Um, he's not somebody who's, you know, um, in a linear way looking for a job. He really um, became an opinion columnist and as such actually has a pretty um, defined brand, right? So um, I think that's also a good example of something to look at. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. So once you've actually sort of decided um, or at least done the homework to figure out what you stand for and also what the competition um, is and sort of figured out what that white space is, right? Because you're trying to get into um, having something that differentiates you, you actually have to articulate your brand positioning. It's like to a particular target, you are what and why? Like what's the actual benefit, right? And so we'll go through an exercise. Let's go on the next page. Um, I'll date myself because we're gonna do Sarah Palin as our example. Um, I don't know how many of you know Sarah Palin, but um, she ran for vice president at one point. And so um, she became known really on a national level at that moment. So if you go to the next page. So in doing that exercise for Sarah Palin, Sarah Palin was the embodiment of conservative America's heartland values that were an antidote to the arrogant liberal establishment's policies of the political and media elite. Right, so you can sort of see what she stood for and how she defined herself against something else. I think a brand really is about what you stand for and also what you stand against, her great um, degree. And so Sarah Palin's kind of a good example of that. Um, if we go to the next page. So then after you've sort of done this exercise, you basically need to figure out how are you gonna actually execute on your brand? How are you gonna have a go-to-market strategy? Um, and so everything you do and say is basically your brand, right? So um, I, I say to my kids all the time, right? Like your social media presence is your brand in a lot of ways, because when you go interview, one of the things people will do is go most likely look at your presence in various places and make judgments, right? About you based on how you're showing up in these places. Um, and I think, you know, in, in, in the time you're graduating, the internet didn't exist when I was graduating from Columbia, Th that scraping the internet to understand how people see you, right? So um, when I start a new job, one of the first things people will do is they'll read the press release and it'll say all the places I worked or they'll go on LinkedIn and they'll see all the places I worked and they'll look up people they know or LinkedIn will tell them people that we have in common and they'll go call them to find out from them what I'm like, right? So my reputation goes from job to job in essence. And so um, that'll be a similar kind of exercise. We're interviewing people. I'll look to see if I know them or I know somebody who knows them or I'll go and look at their social media presence, not me specifically, but somebody will go look to see 
what else they can learn uh, about them. And I think it's really important to think of yourselves sort of in that perspective, almost like the way sort of a celebrity thinks of themselves and their brand. Um, we'll go through a couple of examples. So I just think like everything you say and do actually is reflective of your brand. And I always sort of do this exercise for um, companies. And I say, if you were a person, so if next door was a person, what kind of a person would they be? What would they wear? Um, what kind of a car would they drive, right? So it's an exercise of thinking about your brand as a person is a good example, because we all make decisions or snap judgments about people, um, which we may not like to admit, based on factors that we take in visually when we first see them, or how they show up in a conversation or in a class or in a Zoom meeting, right? So um, if you think of a brand in that way, if Apple was a person, what kind of a person would Apple be? In a lot of ways, you might think of Steve Jobs, and so then you think of somebody who wears a black turtleneck, um, right? And so that's sort of a good exercise to think of yourself sort of in that context. Um, if you show up to a meeting, uh, wearing a suit versus, um, you know, workout clothes, you're saying something about yourself, right? So those are all sort of things to take into context. Let's go to the next slide. Obviously, one of the best people brands is Oprah. I think the longevity and success of Oprah has a lot to do not just with the things she's done deliberately, but also the things she hasn't done. And I think that's a really important thing um, when you think about yourself as a brand because you're pushing against something as much as you're pushing into something. So think of the things you would do versus the things that you wouldn't do. Okay, let's go to the next slide. I think the other thing um, to really think about is this idea of innovation because I think great brands have to constantly innovate. Now they stay true to their core, but they also innovate. And I think that that also um, matters incredibly. So a great example of this, and now let's go to the next slide, I'll predate myself, is the Olsen twins. And I don't know how many of you know the Olsen twins, but they're kind of a great example of a brand that started when they were tiny kids, twins, right, on Full House. And they had a manager who really did a lot of amazing things with their brand. Um, you know, they had DVDs that went straight to market. They were on many shows. By the time they got to NYU, they'd become fashion icons and actually now have a fashion line called The Row, right? So here's a brand that continued to evolve. And as we know, with a lot of celebrities, that doesn't happen. So this didn't happen by accident. I think a more contemporary example of the Olsen twins, which you probably will know well, are the Kardashians, right? Now you may agree or disagree with how they've behaved or how they show up as a brand, but they are definitely a brand. And as I tell people all the time, they're running to the bank as we um, may or may not like what they do because they've been quite deliberate in how they've actually, and I would say probably their mother has been quite deliberate in how she's built that brand over the years. Okay, so next slide. I like to th think of LeBron James as a brand because I think um, he's a super interesting celebrity, particularly if you look at his history. And I'm not a sports person, so this is a hysterical thing that I'm using LeBron James as an example. My husband and children would find this funny. But I, the reason I like LeBron James as a brand is he's been very deliberate. And by the way, celebrities as brands is a particularly complicated thing because, um, you know, they're people and they make mistakes and, um, Sometimes they're the ones behind the brand. Sometimes they have a manager and there's sort of an uncontrollable element to it. But if you think about LeBron James, he's been incredibly good and he's had a partner Maverick who he grew up with. And so really they built this brand and business. And um, from when he went um, from Cleveland to the Lakers, which I remember um, this being considered like the big decision and how that was actually handled, which they tried to manage. But you know, in the end, people were not super happy to have him leave Cleveland. Of course, the Lakers were quite excited, but he early on created Uninterrupted, which was a media company, right? So he early on decided he was going to lean into something which was owning content. He actually partnered with Amy Schumer in a movie called Trainwreck. He was a co-host of the ESPYs. You'll see him here. And then most recently, one of the things he did, which I thought was amazing, is that he actually hosted a graduation ceremony um, that ran across all the networks, right? So now here's a guy who was a sports star who then, you know, had some appearances because he was a very well-known sports star in various media opportunities. But now he's actually inching into sort of more of a um, stand around um, what's happening in society and sort of bringing voices together, including his recent effort to actually impact the voting the opportunity to vote, particularly around um, the Black community. Um, and I think that's super interesting, right? It's a great example of a brand to look at. That doesn't happen by accident. It's quite deliberate. Um, and I think it's a good example, um, a contemporary example to use. Okay, so next slide. 
Um, Madonna is also one of my favorite ones. Now she's sort of gone off the rails of late, but you know, when I was at Columbia, Madonna was a very big deal, right? And she did a lot of things like the Super Bowl. And um, I've been rewatching Glee because um, these days we all need a little moment of joy. And I remember m my kids really didn't know Madonna, but then she actually, Glee did a partnership and actually began to do her song on one of the episodes and so she was introduced to a whole new generation and so she was really an earlier an early person of understanding personal brand from a celebrity basis um, and so she's also another great example to study and a cautionary tale because she's been sort of off the rails of late okay so next slide and I think a good example of a brand that went haywire is Lance Armstrong, right? Who was an incredible brand in the sports arena, right? Did this whole effort. You see that yellow band he wore with Nike around cancer. And then we all discovered that he was doping. And basically that was sort of the end of the Lance Armstrong brand. Now, one of the things we know, particularly in America, is that we love a good redemption story. So we'll see if he's able to redeem himself and redeem that brand and come back. But so far that hasn't actually been successful. So you know, there is a cautionary tale about being true and authentic. And um, today, I would say in the modern world, when you're inauthentic, it actually comes to the forefront much more easily than it ever used to. So um, it's not a good idea to try and not be authentic because it does eventually catch up with you. Okay, so next slide. So if there's four things I'm going to leave you with, it's that you actually have to uncover your assets. You have to understand who you are. Then you have to figure out how you're going to communicate that. And then you're going to have to think about how you're going to develop your go-to-market plan. And then also consider um, innovation. So if I think of, um, I was trying to figure out how to be helpful to you, and I was trying to think of my own brand, I would say um, I'm now known as a purpose-driven change agent. That means something in the business world that's a little bit more complicated probably for um, you guys, because you're like, what the heck does any of that mean? And I would say, um, you know, over the years, probably over the last 15 or 20 years, I've become known for sort of coming into big companies, now I'm in a startup, but coming into big companies and helping them change and um, pivot and go into new directions. So that's sort of what I've become known for. And I do it through the lens of purpose, which is sort of this idea of what is the greater good that the company is trying to create and, and do. And so if I think about that through line, which is that's the through line, sort of the way Tom Peters talked about it, that actually goes across many of my jobs. Um, I discovered purpose when I was at Univision. I did purpose work there. I bought into that. And then I sort of, that became sort of my thing. So then when I went to NBC, I ended up doing purpose work for us and NBC for Jeff Zucker and Steve Burke when we were being bought by Comcast. That became something I got known for. And actually when I went to Gannett, which is the owner of USA Today, and at the time a whole bunch of local media stations, I ended up doing purpose work to help us as we were turning around that company. So by now I had been, th this notion of purpose was deeply ingrained in my career, even though I wasn't an IBM man, I became known for sort of purpose work. And then when I left, when I was leaving um, uh, Gannett, the reason I got recruited to Hyatt is that they were doing purpose work and I was sort of a known entity in that space. And so that was one of the reasons that the, I was an interesting candidate for them. So along the lines of, you know, all the while I was doing that occasionally because this was still a nascent discipline, I would get asked to talk about purpose or I would get asked to write articles. And in fact, I was asked right as I was leaving um, Gannett to uh, actually Hyatt to participate in a book that a woman named Nina Montgomery was doing um, on purpose. And so now I wrote a chapter for Nina's book called Perspectives on Purpose. And then while I was helping Nina, because she actually, fascinatingly enough, Nina, um, when she was graduating from graduate school, she sort of decided to take on this idea of purpose. And she actually crowdsourced her book off of LinkedIn. She reached out to all these different people on LinkedIn to do different parts of her books, so different chapters of her book. So we all sort of became part of her tribe and her network. And then she leveraged us to actually market the book. So after I did the chapter for her on being a purpose champion, um, you know, I was one of 14 people. She found all kinds of people to write chapters for her. Um, I helped her pitch her um, book to Fast Company because I knew that that was a topic that Fast Company was really interested in. And as a result of that, Fast Company ended up exerting my chapter and the one that Ben and Jerry's, the founder of Ben and Jerry's wrote like in their magazine, right? So there are many ways that you become known for something. So one of them was just like being at the job. The other thing is like thought leadership and actually um, having that be a topic that you 
um, talk about publicly and sort of give back on, right? And I think that there's so much more opportunity to do those kinds of things today than there were when I was graduating from school because the internet has really created a um, open model for distribution. You don't need Fast Company to publish your article. You can actually do articles on LinkedIn, for example, right? Or Medium, you can self-publish. And that wasn't really a thing. So I think there's a lot of ways to think about your brand and what you're known for. And in fact, I um, was given, um, as part of my Adweek um, work as sitting on the council, I was um, given to uh, recent mentors recently. And so I was talking to a gentleman who had just left a job and we had a whole conversation. He's originally from Iraq. And he was saying to me, you know, that he's in between jobs and what should he do? And I said, well, okay, you know, one way to go looking for a job. And now remember, I have not had a linear career path is that, you know, you could just be sending a lot of resumes out to people on LinkedIn or, you know, work the Columbia network and things like that. And if I were in your shoes looking for a job, I would 100% be doing that. Of course, I would try and um, narrow in my search because I would want to be, you know, when you call people to ask for an informational or whatever the case may be, they want to know how to help you. And the more specific you are, the more easy it is for them to actually be able to help you. Like I'm looking to get a job at Google. Okay. I know whether I can help you or not, but if I'm just looking for a job, that's a pretty open-ended thing, much harder for me to actually be able to find a through line and to help you quickly. Um, so I think one of the other things that I would say you should do is that you're now graduating in a time, right? That's why I sort of love that LeBron James show is like, there's this incredible sense of hope and wanting to make a difference. And the question is, of course you should be doing those things, but you have very little control over whether people respond to you when you go out to look for a job, right? You send out those resumes and you wait and you know, you can work the network and you should definitely do that. But you don't have to feel like you have no control. You can actually start doing things that you're interested in. And by putting yourself out there, things will show up your way. So for example, in the year and a half that I decided to take time off after Hyatt, I ended up um, being an executive in residence at Columbia. So I did some work there. When I would go and meet students, I would learn new things. They would give me new ideas and that would sort of lead me to do other things, including things like this, like speaking with you guys. But it also got me to write an article, right? And I ended up writing an article about what it was like at my age and in my place in um, life, stepping away from work. And then I um, wrote the piece, I set, submitted it, and the New York Times called me and bought the piece, right? And so then all of a sudden, I became known as somebody who had sort of stepped away and I get asked to come and speak at times about what it's like to step away from a job. And that's actually now become a part of my brand. So when I um, get asked now that I'm at Nextdoor to come and do interviews, I find people not only want to know about what's happening at Nextdoor, they want to sort of go over my career history. And then that article almost always comes up. In fact, I just did a podcast with Jim Stengel, probably one of the biggest names in marketing. And he wanted to talk about that, right? Because it was a very authentic, very um, honest conversation that I sort of put out in the Times about how you know, people react when you decide to step away and what that means and how I really make a point of sort of talking about how it's complicated and how we all have like chapters and choices that we sort of navigate in our lives. And so I've also become sort of known as being very authentic and sort of laying it bare because that's been something I inherently believe in. And frankly, I continue to do that, right? And so brands are built over time and it's about re repetition, right? So um, I would say to you, the other thing that's been interesting as I showed up at this job, which is now a tech startup, is people are always interested in the fact that I've had a pretty diverse career base. And so how did I go from media to hospitality and now to like a tech unicorn in Silicon Valley? And so what that says about me is that I'm actually able to be really um, adaptive, right? And so then it's not such a hard thing to imagine, oh, she could go someplace, someplace else, right? So I think while it wasn't a deliberate decision, when you go back and look, it's like, oh, here's a person who's been um, able to be agile, right? And so people say to me, oh, what a great move. You're now at a tech company. And so now like, this goes back to my point about innovation. It's like, I'm, co I'm constantly innovating. And it's not that I set out to innovate. For me, a big part of taking a job is do I get to learn new things? Um, I wanna have impact. I wanna be able to add value, but I also wanna learn new things. And that's something that motivates me, which is why when most people wouldn't take a job in a space that they're not super comfortable, um, I dive right in, right? And so that's become also part of my brand. Okay, so what's the last thing um, that I'm gonna leave you with? Okay, Jenna, well, I think we're on our last slide. I'm not sure. So, you know, um, I'm sure many of you, well, the iPad stuck around, right? So if you think of yourself as a brand, um, you know, 
you have to think of yourself almost in the in the third person, right? And so it's a really, really good exercise. And with that, I think um, we'll end um, the formal part of this presentation and really just take a minute to answer some of your questions. So I think you're supposed to put your questions in the chat. Um, you know, I love that I'm learning new things, like how to do speech, you know, give talks on a, on, on a Zoom chat. Okay, so it looks like um, one question came in. Is, are you continually innovating to keep your brand fresh or the particular times when you think about innovating? And what can I find good examples of personal brand marketing plans? So, you know, I did this speech originally several years ago, but last night I was uh, updating, updating the presentation and I just Googled personal branding and there were lots of articles on personal branding. And there's a lot of articles written about, um, you know, the Kardashians, for example, because that's a case study that people study because, you know, that doesn't happen by accident. So I would say, um, like I tell my kids, Google's your friend. There's so many videos and discussions on this topic. Um, in terms of when do I think about innovating, um, I'm, I'm motivated by learning. So I'm constantly like sort of looking for um, fresh ideas and, you know, when I was looking, when I stepped away for a year and a half, I really wasn't interested so much in going to all the things that I used to go to in my CMO jobs. I was interested in sort of reconnecting to all the things I was interested in when I was in college. And so I spent a lot of time um, sort of reconnecting to people who I had known earlier in my life. I had been an intern at the Brooklyn Academy of Music. I had worked in British Parliament. I just like reconnected to people. And so that sort of just pushed my thinking. I also got asked to, um, you know, interview people in fireside chats. And it was like being back in school because I got to learn new things, right? I'm sort of like, if my kids ask me to look at a paper before long, I'm like Googling all the people in the, you know, in the, in the story that they're writing or in the paper that they're writing because I get interested. And so all those things sort of become moments of innovation for me because they push my thinking and take me to new places. And I think, um, you know, if I think about myself as a, a brand, which I don't always do, um, you know, like the idea of then moving as somebody in their 50s to a tech company that's considered sort of a Silicon Valley unicorn sort of as an additive thing to my brand, right? And so um, many people now who interview me like sort of point that out, like what a great move, like, you know, um, now you sort of can also call yourself a woman in tech, right? So I was a woman in media, then I was a woman in hospitality, and apparently now I'm a woman in tech. Um, so, you know, I don't deliberately think of it that way, because I think I'm just motivated by curiosity, but um, Hopefully that answers your question. How, okay, here's another one. So how do you adapt your brand across cultures? For example, my social media presence communicates two conflicting messages to two very different cultures. Assuming I wanna keep my professional options open to the two cultures. Well, I don't know exactly what you mean about two cultures. What I would say to you is like, look, a brand shows up in many different ways. So um, if you look at my presence on LinkedIn versus my presence on Instagram versus my presence on Facebook or my presence on um, Twitter, there's a through line. You know, brands have to be consistent. Now, there's a through line and yet there's a point of relevance. So how I show up on LinkedIn is definitely more professional than how I show up on Facebook, but I'm conscious of the fact that that's still like my outside presence, right? And so um, there are things I might not post on LinkedIn, because it's my professional artwork that I might post on, you know, I don't post, you know, pictures of my kids or like, you know, personal um, stories like that on LinkedIn, because that is definitely your professional graph, where I might do that on Facebook. And on Twitter, like really Twitter's not designed for me sharing, you know, you know, baby pictures, but it's really more of a communication mechanism. And so you have to think about relevance in the different places, but there is a through line so that if somebody goes and looks at your presence on these different things, it doesn't seem like a disconnect, um, if that makes any sense. Because, you know, Apple shows up consistently, but different depending on where they are. Um, okay, Jen asks, what if I feel like my brand is heading in the wrong direction? Can I reposition it? 100%. I mean, I think that's what brands do all the time, right? So for a while, J. Crew was um, a really great brand when it first launched. It was a family business. They had a really good run. And then they sort of lost their way. Um, that's what we call turnaround. So Mickey Drexler came in and turned that business around with Jenna Lyons. 
they once again lost their way and now they're trying to redefine that brand. So a good way to look at that, if you feel like your brand's going in the wrong way, is to think about what is the brand you want to be? What's your aspiration? And then you want to map to that. Um, so part of the exercise is you have to take stock in what your brand stands for today and then also understand where you want your brand to go and then think about how do you actually go from A to Z, right? And so if my brand today was about, um, I don't know, about being, um, you can't totally erase it, right? Because like that sort of exists, but like, can you find a through line? I guess that's what I would um, think about. Okay, here's another question. Do you think using volunteerism is a good way to shape your brand? A hundred percent. You know, I've always sort of believed in the idea of getting involved. And so um, if I look at sort of the things I've gotten involved in, they're always things I care about, right? There's a reason I'm the board chair for Reporters Without Borders because I care about press freedom and I care, I, you know, journalism is near and dear to my heart. That is an additive thing to my brand. So when, when they do my bio, when Donna reads that off and you hear that, that gives you sort of an impression. You immediately think, oh, she must care about press freedom or journalism because that's what Reporters um, Without Borders signifies, right? So your volunteerism is definitely part of your brand because you wouldn't go volunteer for something that you didn't care about. And I think that, um, Oftentimes people like think of those things as throwaways, but you know, when you show up and I say this to my kids, cause I have two college age kids, um, how you show up says a lot about you. And so if somebody knows you, and this is a world where we're all very connected. If somebody knows you through your work with that, let's say they know me through my work with that reporters without porters, and they're interviewing me for a job at next door, they may still ask them what, how I'm showing up or what I'm like, right? And that's sort of a reflection of me that goes back. So you have to think that we're like in this incredibly connected web. Um, and so whatever you do, like do your best because, and then when you don't like it, move on. Cause you know, um, basically that becomes your brand, right? And so it's totally fine to change your mind that you don't like something. But while you're there, you want to do your best because that's the thing people constantly go back to, right? And so people, for me, often say, um, you know, it's really clear she's incredibly passionate and, you know, she rolls up her sleeve. Like when they interviewed me for this job, I just had my review not that long ago. My boss said, um, you know, when they hire people from big companies at startups are always worried that like, you know, they're used to having big staffs and I did have big staffs. And so they're not gonna be so good at rolling up their sleeves and doing the work because they've sort of moved on from that. And they were sort of um, delightfully surprised that like when it came down to it, I could also like get into the weeds and actually do my own PowerPoint slides, um, which I always think is so funny. So, but a big part of my brand has always been that, right? I'm, I'm able to think strategically, but get into the weeds. Um, and so I think that's something to think about. Okay, here's, Carlene, do you have advice on how to brand yourself without a ton of experience in the sector you want to pursue? I have a background in government, but would love to enter the private sector in social impact. And you mentioned, I don't want to come across like there's a disconnect. I think there's a through line between your experience um, and where you want to go. And so you just have to be able to make that narrative, right? Um, you have to say your background in government actually is very much um, important to a private sector or job um, that's focused on social impact, right? So if I was um, hiring somebody in the private sector, particularly at a company where social impact was part of the paradigm, I would very much find that your background in government would be interesting. It would give you credibility, in fact. Um, look, I think your interest by definition, like tomorrow, if I wanted to go be a neurosurgeon, that would be a hard thing for you guys to believe. And frankly, it would be very difficult for me to go execute on, but I suppose it'd be possible. My mom always says everything is still possible, which makes me crazy. But the, the idea is there's a, you have to be able to tell that story, right? So the way, think about branding as great storytelling. And so how did you go from one thing to the next? Like, what's that transition? Why are you interested? How do you tell that story? That's really sort of the arc of telling um, and creating that connection. Okay, let's see if other people have questions. Um, I don't know, should I just keep talking? I'm happy to answer all the questions you might have. And maybe you're, you're done with questions, which is um, also totally okay. I'm just clicking on this button because you know, I'm learning new things. What are examples of ways an individual can shape their brand? Um, okay, well, I, I would say to you that like all the, so you know, um, if you're going into the job market, which I'm sure most of you are, like LinkedIn, Twitter, um, 
Instagram, if you don't have it, be private, right? So probably the best two are Twitter and LinkedIn because um, they're publicly facing. Now your Instagram can also not be um, private. So LinkedIn is definitely your social network. And I say that like if I was graduating from school and it's funny, I did this session with, um, with some students at Barnard. So there are things that you, you guys are doing or while you're looking for a job that you can do, um, that you can market. So for example, I met a woman um, who said she was really interested in sports. And I said to her, okay, well then, you know, one of the things I might consider doing to sort of build my credibility around that, and this was when we were not in um, lockdown, was I was like, if you go to the US Open, because she was actually doing some work around tennis, I said, you know, you could actually sort of do a piece, because you can self-publish, on how brands are showing up at, um, at the US Open, right? Because a lot of brands do sort of activations at the US Open. And so you could start writing about the things that you're experiencing. People are always interested in understanding college kids or kids in your age group. Like what are the things you could write um, or things that you could see that you could actually um, begin to actually think about self-publishing, right? Or, or podcasts or interviewing. Um, I think if you begin thinking about content as part of your experience um, and like what areas of expertise do you have? Well, one area of expertise you have is in sort of like what kids your age um, think about or what they're interested in. Like one of the things you could, if I was um, thinking about marketing, one of the things I would think about is like, what's the mindset of people graduating? Um, what are things that they should be doing? For example, what are, what's advice? What, one way you could do a piece would be, I'd go interview five people and say, here's five people and the advice they have, right? So all of a sudden you're putting yourself out into the marketplace in a different way as somebody who's curious, but also able to go find people and aggregate that into an article. And so then when you show up, it's like a portfolio, like that piece where you interviewed five people would be actually part of your portfolio and part of your brand. Um, it shows ingenuity. And so, you know, when I was graduating from college, I um, really had no idea what I wanted to do. And so I, the Gap had this campaign and I basically thought, oh, if I took that campaign, which really featured famous people from underground sort of different cities, if I sort of grouped it with these articles that I used to write about sort of insider places to go see in New York, um, you know, maybe I could get the Gap to like publish my travel guide. Um, when I would, so I, it actually turned out that I mailed it to Mickey Drexler and I, um, he called me and he sort of convinced me that I should go into marketing. But I tell people when I would go on an interview later, even though I didn't go work at The Gap, and I would tell that story, it would almost immediately set me apart from everybody else. And it wasn't intentional, it was just part of my story. And the reason it would set me aside was because one, it was memorable, right? It was a story that was memorable. It wasn't just like a CV. Two, it showed that I had um, ingenuity and I could actually chase something. And even though it didn't land, it was like, oh, here's somebody who actually can make something happen, right? So then I was saying to the students at Barnard, which is how can you create a version of that story for yourself? What are you interested in and what can you lean in on that actually will demonstrate that for yourself? And so that's sort of where I was like, what are you interested in? And somebody said to me, she was doing um, a radio station call. Um, you know, she did a radio station program at Columbia. And I said, okay, well, so let's just play that out. So who's the last person that you booked that you were like, who, who would be the person you'd want to book and how did you go get them? And basically all the people that um, they had booked on the radio station had been people who had called them. And I said, okay, well, I, I would flip that story. I would say, if I was booking a radio show, I would make myself a list of here are the three people I want to go get. And then I would chase them and if I got one, that would become part of my story. So when I was at Barnard, Tama Janowitz wrote the book called Slaves of New York. And so I found a way to get to Tama Janowitz and I interviewed her for the Barnard um, Bulletin. So that, if I told that story, right, it was the ingenuity of being able to chase down Tama Janowitz, write the story, get it published. It says something about me. All those things become part of your brand. So. It's about flipping sort of the things you're doing and thinking about them a different way. Are you, people want to hire people who are chasers who can make things happen. So what can you actually do while you're in this stage of life to actually demonstrate that? That's sort of a way to think about your brand. I will tell you, it's very hard to do this because I can't actually see you guys. So normally I'm used to actually getting energy from the people on the screen who I can't actually see. Um, okay, wait, here's somebody else. Can you describe a successful strategy for telling my personal story? How can I pull all my experiences together 
to curate a successful story? Any advice on what not to do when creating your personal brand? Would you mind sharing step two, the brand template? What are the unique challenges facing journalists looking to build their personal brand? What is the difference between branding and influencing? I'm 35 and just got my BA in computer science. I will work full time through that. Should I hide my work experience to avoid ageism? Um, okay, well, let's try and let's try and break that down. Um, can you describe a successful strategy? Well, my successful strategy is really my gap story. No matter, uh, you know, it's like, it's a thing that happened. And when I tell that story, it just says so many things about me. Um, and so, and it sets me apart, right? And so I never really thought of it that way until I was giving advice to these students. But I think you want to find a story like that. And I think like the fact that at 35, um, you made a career switch and you actually decided to study computer science says a lot about you. And that makes me interested and I want to actually learn more about that. Um, you know, you're still 35, you're not 50. So I don't know if I would worry about ageism. And frankly, you know, um, you know, when I wrote the New York Times, I talked about how I was turning 51 or 52, whatever that was at the time. So, but I have had friends say to me who are in their 50s, not at 35, who say to me that they take the dates off of their um, resumes and that that makes a difference because um, we all know people have unconscious or conscious bias. So you could do that. But I think the thing I would lean into is like, what made you make that change? And the fact that somebody is willing to make that change and go pursue that, I find quite interesting. I think the other thing you have to realize is that Jobs are about fit. You don't want to go someplace where it's not the right fit for you either, because that's not usually a great um, marriage, right? And so you want to work for someone who's actually going to be interested in sort of your journey, not just who's looking for like a cookie cutter, because then that's not going to be such a great place to end up. Um, in terms of step two, um, there's a lot of articles that talk about how to bring your, um, how to articulate your brand positioning. And for me, a lot of it's about um, understanding what you stand for and then figuring out like to what target. So in your case, you're looking for a job, it sounds like in computer science, um, you know, what is it that you bring and how is that different? Which is like, how are you differentiated from other people? That's sort of what you're trying to get to. And in fact, I would say your life experience would in a lot of ways be much more interesting um, because it says something about you and probably understanding that and how that through line comes through is, is a good example. I think a great place to look for storytelling is an organization, a nonprofit called The Moth, because they do these um, a lot of storytelling workshops and I think that that's super useful. Um, what not to do when creating your personal brand. Look, I think one of the great things about storytelling and what I learned in doing that New York Times article is the power of editing. Like, what is the through line is about brevity. You're, you're not trying to ramble on, you're trying to actually be really clear. And so think of like, think of the exercise as a headline. Um, and so, you know, if you, if you go on too long, if you put in too many details, I miss the through line. The reason that I have a dream speech is so successful besides it being super great is that he repeats that phrase over and over again. And so it creates memory. And I think you want to think about your storytelling in that way. So for me, and this is actually another good tip, there's um, something called the Speakers Bureau. The American Speakers Bureau is one, APB. Um, when you look at somebody's bio, so there's many ways people show up. One is a resume, um, which is a version of a LinkedIn profile. Then there's something called a bio. So when I get asked to speak, um, people want to see a bio. So you heard um, Donna do a bio. And then there's a bio that people will have on a speaker's bureau. Um, and so if you look up speaker's bureau, you'll see people who get paid to speak, right? And the way they describe themselves in a speaker's bureau is quite different than how you would probably do a resume or a professional bio. And really that's an exercise in branding because they're basically marketing you on the site as a speaker. And so one of the things like when that, you know, when they approached me to do that that I thought about was what is the story that I want to tell? And what are the topics that I want to actually talk about, right? So all those become decisions and become part of your brand. Um, and part of it's also what's your experience, right? Because people don't want you to talk about things you don't know anything about. So that's why I say, um, depending on where you are in life, like think about the experience that you have to, to bring to bear um, to the topic. And that's also a critical part of the discussion. Okay. Um, branding is what you stand for and influencing, 
I think, you know, this is why I love marketing because there's so many words that are sort of overlapping. Um, you know, influencer marketing is a thing, right? Like influence is, you know, I think of, let, let's try and see if I can parse that one because that's not so easy. I mean, I think of Oprah as a brand and I think Oprah has influence as a result of the brand that she has. Um, influencing is like sort of your, it's what you do with your brand. It's not the end point. And I think um, the brand is really what you stand for right? That, that's how I would think about a brand. Um, and if you stand for something, then you can go influence using that brand. But it's, you, influencing is not the end point in and of itself. I hope that helps. Okay. How do you brand yourself if you have a set of skills and experiences that could be used in various roles? I've experienced in management consulting and recently graduated with a degree in data science. I want to go into tech would you be willing to do various roles? Um, I want a position that integrates both. So it could be marketing, strategy, operations. How can I be clear about that? Um, let's see. I, I think that the management consulting and data science, so each of those things says something. When I meet somebody who's worked in management consulting, what I understand immediately, like what that tells me is, because um, those jobs tend to be really like demanding. So I know that they've worked in a very rigorous setting. I know they're quite analytical, those jobs. Um, so that all immediately says something to me, right? Because I know that they're analytical and they're thinking and they worked in a very demanding environment that was probably incredibly thorough. So it's kind of like an imprimatur, right? It gives you a stamp of approval. And then look, everybody's obsessed with data science now because we now live in a time where there's just a lot of data and you need to know how to analyze them. I think that the key for me when I look at people in data science is can they take that data science and tell it as a story? Because you know what I don't want for my data scientists is lots of bar charts. I want somebody to take those and sort of be able to give them to me in a way that I can ingest it. Um, and so probably the best example that I can give you is that book Moneyball, right? Because Moneyball, and again, I mean, you now know I'm not a sports person. The amazing thing about Moneyball is like you hear the story, right? They tell that story of a guy who analyzed the numbers and was able to use it in storytelling to convince that team how to actually make decisions differently. And that actually enabled them to see patterns that people couldn't see before, which enabled them to win, right? So I would say like, you actually have this opportunity to bring these things together. And I would think that your management consulting experience combined with your data science experience would be particularly interesting. And the thing that I would lean into is how those skills in management consulting enables you to actually do that data science job differently than somebody who just only did data science, right? Because you can actually take the data science and use and apply strategy, um, you know, to people's marketing strategies and operational strategies, right? So I think that's actually something I would weave together because um, I think that's actually a really interesting background. Okay. I don't know if anybody has, anybody else has questions. Um, okay. So um, thank you guys so much for listening and for teaching me how to do Zoom speaking, right? Because I'm learning new things. Um, and like I said, you know, I learn by way of example. So um, you can go and take a look at like my LinkedIn profile. I, when I was redoing my LinkedIn profile, when I stepped away, um, I looked at how other people did them, like even from the pictures that they use on the back, how they describe themselves. I think those are all things to think about. And I think, um, you know, try and look at people who you, view as people to emulate and, and learn from what they've done, right? So when I did it, I went and looked at like 10 other CMOs and how they presented themselves. And that sort of gave me ideas of how to do that myself. But think of all the surface areas where you show up and then sort of look at, um, at how other people do that and learn from that as a way to have input into how you want to present yourself to the world. So thank you so much. And thank you for being um, part of this amazing Columbia community. And that's it.